One of the reasons why I don't care for tokenizing real world assets is because real world assets, whether it's this TV, whether it's that painting, they're confiscatable. And having your real estate on the blockchain is irrelevant because your real estate could be confiscated. If the Native Americans had their real estate on the blockchain, would it really matter, right? If someone, if I have land in America and then someone says, well, actually that's my land, it's in a blockchain from 300 years ago, it doesn't work that way, right? Well, my family's been on this land for the last 100 years. You know, who owns this land? Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And of course, here we're during the Christmas season. So we're hoping that you're having a wonderful time eating tons of chocolate, sugar canes, and getting nice and chubby for the winter. But anyways, we're here direct from the CC Forum. Today, we have another living legend and someone who's been helping us a lot as an ambassador Tone Vase, a pleasure to have you, my friend. Oh man, thanks, Alex. <laughs> Not too tired after the two days of craziness that just happened? No, it's okay. There's uh, plenty of craziness on the stage, off the stage. It's, uh, it's one of those conferences. It is one of those conferences indeed. Tone, you, you have so much good information, but before diving into you know, the cool technicals and your financial background stuff, could you tell us really like what led you to this space? And obviously you're traveling constantly spreading the word, sharing your passion message. What is it that you really loved about this? Uh, yeah, so um, I was working on Wall Street from uh, actually before the financial crisis. It was from around very early 2007, like January 2007. And um, around 2010, 2011, I started following the Ron Paul campaign uh, for president uh, in the US. Uh, that led me to listening to a lot of RT because they were actually covering him. Uh, Max Kaiser's show was talking about Bitcoin in late 2010, early 2011 as a use case for WikiLeaks to fund their operation when they got cut off from Visa, MasterCard and PayPal. And I thought that use case was very interesting. But it wasn't until the Cyprus confiscation of money in 2013 that I really take Bitcoin seriously. That led me to buying my first few Satoshis and led me into the space, started reading a lot more about it, following it. And in 2014, I spoke at my first conference, started writing articles about Bitcoin in Cointelegraph, which had just launched and they picked me up as a writer. And in 2015, I quit my job, started my YouTube channel, started uh, uh, making a career as a trader. Uh, but kind of the YouTube channel started taking off, more speaking gigs were happening. And now I basically travel the world and try to educate people about Bitcoin. And I finance that by teaching people how to be traders because trading isn't going anywhere. When I stop my traveling lifestyle, I trade on my own, open a fund. I don't know. The options are there. Trading was the same before I was alive. It'll be, the, it'll be there when I'm dead. The tools to trade will be a little more advanced like they are now versus even when I started trading in early 2000s. That's amazing. And actually, unconfiscatability, I can't even pronounce it. Unconfiscatability. I've coined the term. You I, have a, I have a conference <laughs> called Unconfiscatable. I own the domain. You own the domain? Yeah. Like when I looked up that word, I, so you trademarked it, didn't you? Was that your uh, trademark? Not officially. Like, like I like trademarks, but only when like someone is profiting off your trademark brand. I mean, everyone knows Unconfiscatable is my brand. I don't even need to go and patent it because if someone else tries to trademark the brand, I own the .com. Like what better, <laughs> like what else is there, right? What, el what else is there to say? Uh, but yeah, I pretty, I'm pretty much the Unconfiscatable brand. Whether it has an official little TM on it or not, it doesn't matter. <laughs> that is so cool. But is that really the feature that you really appreciate the most or one of them that you really like in terms of Bitcoin? I think it's the most important feature. Uh, and people haven't realized how important that feature is because prior to Bitcoin, humans have never owned anything that was unconfiscatable. Anything you have ever owned throughout the history of the planet was always at risk of confiscation by someone with a bigger gun or someone that can make a law 
and force you to do something, but no one knows how much Bitcoin you have. No one should even know if you have Bitcoin. In fact, if you're not, you know, a silly YouTuber, no one should even know you ever heard of Bitcoin and you can keep as much value in it as you can. Uh, and so far in its 10 year history, Bitcoin has proven to be unconfiscatable. Will that property last forever? We don't know, but my money is on the fact that it will. Maybe not forever, but at least uh, for my lifetime. And people don't realize how important that is. Throughout history, all governments, whether it was the caste system or any system before uh, the, the democracy, before socialism, before communism, uh, there were always incidents of taking away people's wealth. And uh, money has always been debased. Uh, taxes have always gone up. Uh, in Europe, you know, the whole window tax and why we have, uh, you know, people started building houses to have less windows. Like the governments always find a way to tax your immovable assets. And the easier it is to move your assets, the harder it is to tax them. This is why we have a lot of real estate taxes and, you know, there's death taxes, there's taxes on everything. And they can try and tax your crypto, but if they don't know you have it, uh, because taxation and money debasement, they're just forms of tax that aren't in your face. And Bitcoin can let you escape that. It lets you escape negative interest rates when a bank says, if you hold the money with us, we'll charge you for holding that money. You can escape that with Bitcoin. Uh, so I think it's the most important property. And in times of distress, in times of war, again, Europe knows this better than anyone. Uh, what happened? in France and other countries when Germany was invading. You would try to build a wall inside your basement to hide your wine, your art. You, you have to protect your savings somehow. And gold was a good unconfiscatable asset because you can bury it in the ground and no one has to know you have it. But with the invention of metal detectors, it becomes very, very challenging. You know, gold is no longer unconfiscatable because they'll find it. They have lots of technology, you know, fly a helicopter over your property and it can like do, uh, you know, sonar and other stuff uh, to try and find whatever they like, but they can't get your Bitcoin. And I think it's even more important than the censorship resistant value transfer part. That is so fascinating. And you actually made a, I'll jump onto that later, but you made a great video about Bitcoin versus gold in, in one of your recent YouTube uh, uploads, which is awesome. We'll, we'll cover that a little bit later. But I really understand what you're talking about because my family from Iran after the revolution, we lost everything. Our home, our property, everything uh, was confiscated by the government and the Islamists and stuff. So I, I really relate yeah. to what you and said. You never know when your country might be invaded. I mean, the, I don't think U.S. has to worry about being invaded. Russia probably doesn't have to worry about being invaded. China probably doesn't. But if you're not one of those three countries, um, you have a history of being invaded. And uh, just because, you know, it's 100 years later doesn't mean that that will change. That's a really good point. I heard a story about a guy who was going through borders in South America and just memorized his private keys as people wanted to take it away. And he left no traceability except for his mind. He remembered the entire private key and sure. was able to go across. Now borders. that <laughs> comes with an inherent risk of if you forget your private key, you just lost all of your Bitcoin. Uh, but hey, that's the good with the bad. In order to have unconfiscatable value, no one else can know your private key or your password. Uh, so the good with the bad, and I think it's so valuable. Like uh, just throughout history, uh, governments always go for the money. That's a really good point. Speaking of money, so obviously you had some awesome debates on your channel about BTC versus gold versus fiat currency. If you don't mind weighing in, because th that was such a useful video, we'll put a link so people can watch that as well. But could you mind summarizing or sharing some critical points that you learned through these debates? Man, I have so many videos. Uh, <laughs> uh, but, uh, but yeah, I debated about even the value of gold. Uh, look, the value, gold has its place. But I think uh, Bitcoin will displace gold because uh, the real value of gold is slowly going away because gold lost a lot of value in a digital age. Because with the advancement of technology and modern banking, uh, it became very difficult to transact in gold uh, because now we are all digital and electronic. 
And that's why we went to paper money backed by gold, but government uh, had too much control and they severed that bond. I don't really necessarily have a problem of money being backed by gold, but when you have politicians that can make their own rules and, ro and laws, uh, they will sever that bond. Now, I don't think gold is a very good investment uh, because gold does not, while gold does a great job accounting for inflation, gold does nothing to account for the advancement in technology. And this is why, you know, one ounce of gold bought you a very nice suit uh, in 1913 when the Fed was created. And today that one ounce of gold still buys you the same nice suit. But if you sold that gold ounce in 1913 and you put it into the stock market, because the stock market also adjusts for inflation, but it also adjusts for technology because the inefficient companies leave and better companies come into the index. And that is why if you had invested that ounce of gold into the stock market 100 years ago, you probably own multiple suit factories today <laughs> instead of a single suit. Um, and that is why gold is not a good investment. It's good, it's, it's good to, have, to have your money be harder so your money doesn't depreciate, but that doesn't make it a good investment. And this is where I have a big problem with the gold bugs that are just praying uh, for the biggest catastrophe the world had ever seen so that their gold makes them rich. Uh, what they don't realize and what should have been proven to them in 2008 during the financial crisis is that when a real crisis hits and everyone loses their jobs and the banking system is failing, no one is going out and buying gold. In fact, if you have gold, including gold teeth, you're ripping them out <laughs> to sell them so you can feed your family. And that's why gold fell 33% in 2008, along with the stock market falling 50%. It was not you know, the best investment. And uh, people have to, you know, consider that and think about that. And of course, Bitcoin can suffer as well. If there is a really big financial crisis and you have some Bitcoin, but you have to, you know, put food on the table, you're going to have to sell some of that Bitcoin in order to do that. And, uh, and this whole concept of the gloom and doomers that are just praying for a financial crisis it's like, why don't you just, you know, next time you're at your Christmas dinner, why don't you just stand up and say, I want all of you to lose your jobs and I want all of you, you know, to lose your business just so my three ounces of gold in the, in the safe can go up in value. <laughs> yeah. I think we had Andreas Antonopoulos saying the same thing. We should never wish for a crisis no matter what because people might have to sell Bitcoin to ex exactly put food on the plate. That's a really, really good point. And in terms of the features of Bitcoin itself, obviously there are many things that you like about it. But these during these debates uh, in the past two days, a lot of people are talking about shitcoins. Did you trademark that word shitcoin? No, I did not. Actually, <laughs> I've recently, I have recently discovered uh, the first time, I didn't discover it, I found it on, uh, I actually found it There's on- There's a definition, uh, right, on Google? No, not a definition. <laughs> uh, somebody tweeted this out. I will, I will read it, and then you tell me what you think the date of this is. All right. <laughs> okay. gonna, this was on uh, Bitcoin Talk. I see the date. So here it is. Someone replied to a comment. You say that now, but if Bitcoin really takes off, I can see lots of get rich quick imitations coming on the scene. Gitcoin, Nitcoin, Witcoin, Titcoin, Shitcoin. Some of them are sure to attract users and uh, with promises like why use Bitcoin, where you can only get 50 Bitcoins every few months. Use Shitcoin instead. You'll get 51 Shitcoins every two minutes. Of course, the cheap imitators will disappear as quickly as the 1990s internet currencies like flus and beans, uh, but lots of people will get burned along the way. Um, um, when, Did you print that and put it on your wall? Uh, <laughs> when do you think this was posted? Uh, I would say before the ICO craze, perhaps. So I'd say one, January 2017. November 2010. No way. It wasn't you? No, that wasn't me. I was not in this case. Actually, that was before I heard of it. Because it's impossible for me to have heard about Bitcoin in November of 2010. 
because the first time Bitcoin was ever mentioned to be used for WikiLeaks donations was in December of 2010. And they didn't accept it for the nations until June or July 2011. So somewhere between December 2010 and July 2011 is when I first heard of Bitcoin. But somebody posted this in 2010 before there was a single altcoin. This is back when there was only Bitcoin. Visionary, huh? An absolute visionary, that person. So what is the definition for the new bees out there? What is, how would you define a shit coin? Like what is to you a shit coin? All right. So uh, at this point, a shit coin is pretty much anything that is in Bitcoin, uh, which would have been my answer to the Senator that asked the question. We have Bitcoin and we have shit coins. And I would have said, that's exactly right, Senator. We have Bitcoin and we have shit coins. Now, ICOs are a little bit different. To me, ICOs are unlicensed, unregistered, uncompliant, and illegal securities. Those are ICOs to me. But uh, to me, shitcoins is uh, pretty much anything. Litecoin, Ethereum, though Ethereum was also an ICO. Uh, Monero, for example. Uh, to me, they're considered shitcoins. Uh, now, some of them are, were created with a malicious, fraudulent, scammy nature. And some of them were not created uh, as a malicious, fraudulent nature, but that doesn't mean they're good projects. It doesn't mean they're good investments. So for example, I don't believe Litecoin was created maliciously for, for you know, a small group of people to get rich. I don't believe Monero was created maliciously for a few people to get rich. On the other hand, I believe Ethereum was created for a few people to get rich. So was Ripple, so was Dash, and so were pretty much anything created after 2012. So anything created in 2013 and beyond, uh, by then, uh, you already know you're creating this to get rich. Back when Charlie Lee launched Litecoin in 2011, back when Monero launched, I believe in 2012, maybe 2013. Um, back then, they were still thought of as science experiments. Uh, but after thinking and reflecting and actually understanding the, the ecosystem, it's pretty clear to many of us why Litecoin and Monero, they just, they will never be Bitcoin. They can't. What Bitcoin did in its first two years of existence is not replicatable. This is what makes it decentralized. It's not because some guy is funding a bunch of developers that made it decentralized. That's not how it works. It was decentralized because it was a grassroots effort, not knowing if it was ever going to have value. That's what made it decentralized. Uh, the fact that it was able to spread around the world, the fact that there are hard drives in landfills with thousands of Bitcoin on them is what made it decentralized. And no other coin will ever have that. So that's why they will never compete. A Litecoin, is, you don't need a silver to Bitcoin's gold. In fact, you don't need silver to gold. And what a lot of people don't realize and what the book, The Bitcoin Standard by Seyfedean pointed out uh, he should have elaborated on it even more, but if you paid attention to that book, it made it clear why silver should have zero monetary property. Because with the advancement of modern banking, gold could now scale. Back in the day, you needed silver as a micropayment to gold. Someone needed to buy their coffee, and then the gram of gold was just too expensive. But once paper currency was backed by gold, you can now go and buy that cup of coffee with gold. Now the government broke that promise, but the technology is there to scale gold for micropayments. So what is the need for silver as a monetary role? There isn't. Silver will just go back to being an industrial metal. Uh, and it's a very good industrial metal, but its use as an industrial metal is being uh, taken away by its monetary premium which shouldn't exist if people actually thought about the fact that unless you think we're going to lose electricity again uh, for the whole world, which in which case you have a much bigger problem, like thousands of nuclear facilities that would melt down, right? Uh, silver is never going to be money again, no matter what. It's going to be gold. If it's going to be something metal, it's going to be gold. And th that's the same problem that Litecoin has. It just will never compete. It will never compete with the Lightning Network. And as far as Monero is concerned, sure, it it's nice to have on-chain privacy, 
but so few transactions are gonna be done on chain because you can't scale on chain transactions. You gotta scale them off chain. And off chain, Bitcoin has a dozen good proposals to give you privacy and fungibility as a second layer solution through wallets, through Lightning, through Liquid, and through lots of other innovations that are coming between Taproot and Bulletproofs and the latest in Schnorr signatures. Uh, Bitcoin will have sufficient privacy uh, for, for the needs of consumers. So in terms of the, the whole shitcoin debate, what if, so let's say Bitcoin is, is king, digital gold, doesn't need a silver. What if there are some uh, people that use blockchain for a completely different purpose that's not trying to compete with Bitcoin, let's say data protection, the Brave browser, but uh, would those also be considered shit coins in your book or if they're well, serving a different purpose? Well, they shouldn't need their own currency. Um, I don't understand this. And, and this is where I agree with Noriel Rubini, where, uh, but he calls everything a shit coin, including Bitcoin. And yeah. that's my only disagreement with him. Uh, but I agree with him that every single company and every single person having their own token and their own money is going back to the barter system. Uh, that's an archaic system. Uh, there is a reason why uh, you can't pay for Amazon products with Amazon stock because it makes absolutely no sense. Uh, there is a reason why uh, eBay, for example, you don't uh, go on eBay and have eBay say, no, 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 you can only buy it with eBay stock as the currency and forget about the fact that eBay stock is a lot more volatile and changes in price every single minute of every day uh, versus any kind of a fiat currency that is actually a unit of account. Uh, and then you go to a world where, oh, fine, I have to use eBay stock to purchase on eBay. I'll go and buy eBay stock. Well, how do you buy eBay stock? Well, you got to go through a broker. You got to go find E-Trader, Charles Schwab. All right, I'm going to go uh, buy my eBay stock through E-Trade. All right, I, I'll log in into E-Trade. I have to create an account on E-Trade. I want to buy eBay stock so I can go buy from eBay. And E-Trade says, no, 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 no. You got to go and buy eBay. You got to go and buy E-Trade stock. So then you can use E-Trade stock to buy the eBay stock to then go and buy from eBay. This is the world of... I'm going to create a Brave browser and I'm going to use my own money inside the Brave browser. Uh, it's also a very scammy practice of saying you post your content on my platform and I will pay you in the currency that I just invented yesterday. This is the Steemit business model where they say come post on Steemit and we pay you in Steam. Well, where does Steam come from? Ah, oh, that Larimer just invented it and printed a billion tokens for himself. No, don't worry about that. We'll pay you in Steam and then you sell it to some fool that's going to hold that bag and watch it depreciate in value because eventually the world isn't that stupid. Um, so I spoke out against projects like Steam and the Brave browser. Now, the Brave browser may have pretty good technology in it, but I hate the fact that they have to print their own money, money to in order to do it. Mm -hmm. This is the same problem that I have with Binance. For somehow in the 300 year history of stock markets and exchanges, it was able to be done without your own money and your own token. Yet Binance is somehow revolutionary because they created a token that they hyped up in price due to unqualified investors and speculative trading and, uh, and trading on unregistered exchanges no KYC, no age restrictions, just taking advantage of speculators. And they created this token and said, well, if you use our token, you pay smaller commissions, mm -hmm. pumping the value of the token, which they're holding a giant majority of. And then they use that money to have an advantage on their competition that isn't being dishonest by creating their own money or what I, as my opinion, feel is an uncompliant illegal security. And now they have a billion dollars to spend while other exchanges are, you know, uh, scraping their way to a $5 million investment from a credited investor. And they just printed a billion dollars or whatever the market cap of the Binance token is. So and they can print as many of those tokens as they like. They can dilute it as much as they like. There's nothing stopping them. There's no regulation on that token whatsoever. And this is the scammy practice 
of printing your own money and securities that, you know, we have uh, laws are supposed to prevent that, but hey, no one, no, no one's enforcing it. No, everyone's ignoring it. And um, I think this is a very, I think this will end badly for the whole ecosystem. Mm, that's really interesting. So there should be one form of money, like you said, gold dominates, Bitcoin dominates one other sector. It, what if these coins or tokens would be some form of membership, you know, like getting your card for the gym and have a different utility that doesn't want to be cash or something like that? It, I'm actually okay with that. Like uh, One of the two um, ICOs that I didn't really have a big problem with conceptually, I had a problem with the fact that it was an ERC-20 built on Ethereum, which I think is an unscalable technology. Uh, but we now have better technology to build your token on, like Liquid, and that technology is improving. And you can always migrate from the Ethereum platform to something that's actually scalable and better. But as far as the conception goes, I don't have a problem with having a membership token. And in fact, I find that to be a reasonable use of the blockchain because the blockchain uh, gives you certain properties. Uh, one of the reasons why I don't care for uh, tokenizing real world assets is because real world assets, whether it's this TV, whether it's that painting, they're confiscatable. Um, uh, and having your real estate on the blockchain is irrelevant because your real estate could be confiscated. Uh, so so it, it really doesn't matter. Um, if the Native Americans had their real estate on the blockchain, would it really matter, right? If someone, if I have land in America and then someone says, well, actually that's my land, it's in a blockchain from 300 years ago, it doesn't work that way, right? Well, my family's been on this land for the last 100 years. You know, who owns this land? Um, so it's, uh, it doesn't work that way. So the blockchain is really only useful for things that are not, don't exist in the physical world. Uh, so then people try to use it. Well, what about your medical records? Your medical records doesn't actually exist, don't actually exist in the physical world. Uh, you can print them out, you can leave them somewhere, but you should always have a, you know, a digital copy to protect. So when people say, let's put medical records on the blockchain, to me, that's also kind of ridiculous because you don't want to accidentally delete your medical records, which is what a blockchain will do. Uh, so what's the point? If you want someone to keep an eye and control of that, those digital records, like that, the blockchain doesn't do that for you. Like there's no reason to hide your medical records only in your head like we do with money, which I think there is a need for that because someone is always hunting for your money. Now, granted, there are nefarious actors that are hunting for your medical records, but this is why we have encryption and there could be centralized entities that can protect your medical records better than you can protect them yourself. Uh, so once again, that use case for me starts to break down. But when it comes to memberships, as silly as it sounds, there could be a blockchain use there because Thank you guys so much for watching this last video of season two with Tone Vase. We really look forward to having you guys at season three. And in the meantime, and more importantly, happy new year to all you viewers out there. We really appreciate your support. In the meantime, if you have any special guests that you want us to invite, we will do our best for you. So just put their names in the comments below and we'll get back to you. We will have a special edition and the best of season one and season two coming out in the weeks to come. Thanks again, guys. We love you and see you soon.